The Well by Julian Kilman Jeremiah Hubbard toiled with a team of horses in a piece of ground some distance down the road from his dwelling. When it neared five o'clock in the autumn afternoon, he unwound the lines from his waist, unhooked the traces, and started home with his horses. He was a heavy man, a bit under middle age, with a dish-shaped face and narrow-set eyes. He walked with vigor. One of the horses lagged a trifle, and he struck it savagely with a short whip. They came presently to the Eldridge dwelling, abandoned and tumbled down on the opposite side of the road. The farm was being worked on shares by a man named Simpson, who lived five miles away and drove a tin Lizzie. An ancient oak tree, the tremendous circumference of its trunk, marred by signs of decay, reared splendid gnarled branches skyward. These branches shaded a disused well, a well that had been the first one in Nicholas County, having been dug in the early fifties by the pioneering Eldridge family. It went forty feet straight down into the residual soil characteristic of the locale, but, owing to improved drainage, it had become dry. Nothing remained of the old pump house save the crumbling circle of stonework around the mouth to give evidence of its one-time majesty. A child of eight ran from the rear of the premises. Hubbard frowned and stopped his team. You better keep away from there, he growled, or you'll fall into the well. The girl glanced at him impishly. You and Mrs. Hubbard don't speak to each other, do you? Hubbard's face went black. His whip sprang out and caught the girl about the legs. She yelped and ran. An eighth of a mile farther along the road, Hubbard turned in and drove his team into a big barn. He fed his stock. It was after six when he entered the house. This was a structure that, by comparison with the gigantic barn in the rear, seemed pygmy-like. A sallow, flat-chested woman with a wisp of hair twisted into a knot took from Hubbard the two pails of milk he carried. She set them in the kitchen. The two exchanged no words. Hubbard strode to the washstand, his boots thumping on the floor, and performed his ablutions. He rumpled his hair and beard, using much soap and water, and blowing sturtuously. In the dining room, a girl of twelve sat with a book. As her father came in, she glanced at him timorously. He gave no heed to her as he slumped down into a chair standing before a desk. The desk was littered with papers, among which were typewritten sheets of the sort referred to as pleadings. There was a title search, much bethumbed and black along the edges, where the setouts had been scanned with obvious care. The man adjusted a pair of antiquated spectacles to his dish face. To do this, he was compelled to pull the ends of the bows tight back over the ears, as his nose afforded practically no bridge to support the glasses. Presently, he spoke to the girl. Tell your mother to bring the supper. The girl hastened out, and shortly thereafter the mother appeared carrying dishes. Food was disposed about the table in silence. The farmer ate gustily, and in ten minutes finished his meal. Then he addressed his daughter keeping his eyes averted from his wife. "'Tell your mother,' he said, "'that I'll want breakfast at five o'clock tomorrow morning.' "'Where are you going, Pa?' asked the girl. "'I'm going to drive to the county seat to see Lawyer Simmons.' Hubbard's gaze followed the girl as she helped clear the table. "'Look a-here,' he said. "'You been a-talking to that Harper child?' "'No,' returned the daughter, with a trace of spirit. "'But I just saw her father over by the fence.' What was he a-doin' there? I didn't stay. I was afeard he'd catch me a-watchin' him. Hubbard glowered and reached for his hat. I'll find out, he snarled. Walking rapidly, he crossed a field of wheat stubble, keeping his eyes fixed sharply ahead. It was dusk, but presently, at the northern extremity of his premises, he made out the figure of a man. Hey, Harper, he shouted. You let that fence be. He ran forward swiftly. The men were now separated by two wire-strand fences that paralleled each other only three feet apart. These fences, matching one another for a distance of about 200 yards, each farmer claiming title to the fence on the side farthest from his own, represented the basis of the litigation over the boundary claim 
that had gone on between them for four years. The odd spectacle of the twin fences had come to be one of the show places in the county. It had been photographed and shown in agricultural journals. I don't trust ye, Harper, announced Hubbard, breathing hard. You got the inside track with Judge Bissell, and the two of you are a scheming to beat me. A laugh broke from the other. I'll beat you all right, he said coolly, but it won't be because Judge Bissell is unfair. His manner enraged Hubbard, who rushed swiftly at the first fence and threw himself over. With equal celerity, he clambered over the second fence. Startled at the sudden outburst of temper, Harper had drawn back. He held aloft a spade. Hubbard leaped at him. The spade descended. Harper was slightly built, however, and the force of the blow did not halt the infuriated man, now swinging at him with all his might. They clinched. Hubbard's fingers caught at the throat of the smaller man, and the two stumbled to the ground, Hubbard atop. The fall broke his grip. With huge fists, he began to hammer the body. He continued until it was limp. Then, his rage suddenly appeased, he drew back and stared at the inert figure, lying strangely quiet. So, he gasped. There came the sound of someone singing, the voice floating distinctly through the night air. Hubbard recognized it for that of the itinerant Free Methodist minister, whose church in Ovid he and his family occasionally attended. The song rolling forth as the man of God drove along the highway in his rig was Jesus, lover of my soul. For the moment, Hubbard shielded his face with an arm as if to ward off an invisible thing. Then, bending over the prostrate form, he ran his hand inside the clothing to test the action of the heart. He performed the act mechanically, because he knew he had killed the man. He discovered the handbag. Evidently, Harper was on his way to Ovid to catch the train to the county seat for the trial on the morrow. This meant that he would not be missed by his wife for at least twenty-four hours. The murderer studied his next move. Where to secrete the body? A piece of wood lay back of him, but he was aware that it was constantly combed by squirrel hunters. He thought of the railroad. Why not an accident? Killed by the very train he was bound for. He started to lug the body toward the track, which passed half a mile to the north. Realizing, however, that for the time at hand the distance was too great, he let the body slide to the ground. Next, he stole along the twin fences to the highway and peered both ways. No one seemed abroad. He came back on the dead run, and in twenty minutes he had carried the body to the Eldridge premises and flung it down the ancient well. When he returned, he found his wife and daughter together in the parlor, where the itinerant preacher, all three, were kneeling on the floor in prayer. Hubbard unceremoniously nudged the clergyman. "'That'll do,' he said. The minister rose, his tall, lanky figure towering over Hubbard. "'Brother?' he began. In an orotund voice, "'Come with the Lord.' "'Yes, I know,' returned Hubbard, with a patience that surprised his wife. "'But I've got something to talk over with my family.' He paused. "'Here,' he added, feeling his pocket and producing a small coin. Take this and go along. When the preacher had left, Hubbard called to his daughter. Harper was gone when I got over the fence. What kept you so long? I walked over to the woods. There's a nest of coons. They're going to play havoc with the corn. He smiled unnaturally. Look a here. If we can catch them, I'll give you the money their pelts bring. Hubbard divined that his acting was poor. Both the girl and his wife were frankly regarding him. Well, he shouted, what's the matter with you? Oh, nothing, Pa, nothing, whimpered the girl. Then go to bed, the two of you. The next morning, Hubbard started for the county seat, a ten-mile drive. He returned that evening and complained that the case had been adjourned because Harper had failed to appear in court. The following day, he went back to his field far down the road for more plowing. Twice he was called to the roadside by passers-by to discuss the disappearance of Harper. One morning, a week later, when he came along the road with his team, he discovered the Harper child on the Eldridge premises. She was sitting at the edge of the well. With a suppressed oath, he dropped the lines and half-walked, half-ran to where the little girl sat. "'Didn't I tell you to stay away from there?' he exploded. 
The girl stared at him, but made no move, though her lips quivered. Hubbard glanced back to observe the road. Then he caught her arm. Go home, he shouted. He spun her roughly. She continued to stare at him as she retreated homeward. All that morning, Hubbard worked his horses hard. He realized that he was eager to go back by the Eldridge dwelling. Promptly at twelve o'clock, therefore, he tied his team and started up the road. A flash of relief came to him when he did not observe the little girl. It left him cold, however. Eaten dinner, he mumbled. He moved off without looking into the well. Until four o'clock that afternoon, he labored. On his way home, he discovered the girl again seated by the well. She was bending over and acting queerly. Hurrying his horses to the roadside, he looped the lines over one of the posts in the old snake fence. As he approached, he saw her toss a piece of stone down the hole. Hubbard waited until he was sure of his voice. Come with me, he said. Gripping the girl, he started with her toward her home, but a short distance away. When they arrived, the front door was ajar. A woman, with eyes red from weeping, looked at Hubbard in silence. Here, he said gruffly, this child ought to be kept to home. She'll fall into the well. Mrs. Harper merely reached out her arms for her daughter. Hubbard remained standing, awkwardly. Have you heard anything of Harper yet? he asked. I don't want to talk to you, replied the woman. Hubbard turned on his heel. Waiting for him by his horses was the deputy sheriff. The two further discussed the disappearance. If you yourself wasn't so well known, Jeremiah, finally declared the official, they'd sure be thinking you was in it some way. Why, grunted the farmer as he untied the lines. Well, everybody knows you and Harper been lawing it for years over that boundary line. Hubbard achieved a laugh. I'll tell you where Harper is. He's cleared out. That's what I think. Deserted his family. That night and many following nights, Hubbard did not sleep. Some weeks later, a tremendous electric storm broke in the night. One particularly heavy clap so startled the wakeful Hubbard that he leaped up from his bed and dressed. In the pouring rain, he started out. Inevitably, his steps took him toward the well. It was black, and he could not see it first. But another flash came, and he observed a strange thing. The huge oak standing at the side of the well had been split in two by lightning and one portion of the tree had fallen over the mouth of the hole. Next morning, Simpson, the man with the tin Lizzie, stopped at Hubbard's place. He was a blunt-spoken, red-faced man, whom Hubbard hated. That was a bad storm last night, he said. The lightning struck the big oak tree by the well. What of it? snapped Hubbard. There was a skeleton in the center of that tree, explained Simpson. I was talking this morning with the sheriff over the telephone. He said 75 years ago, a man was murdered in Ovid, and they never found his body. This skeleton must be his. Hubbard cleared his throat sharply. What did you do with it? The skull and one of the leg bones fell down into the well when I tried to gather them up. I want to borrow some rope so I can go down there. For a bare second, Hubbard was silent. What you ought to do, he said, gathering himself, is to fill up that hole. It's dangerous. Yes, that's so. But I'm going to get that skull first. It'll be a good exhibit. I'm wondering whether we'll ever find Harper's skeleton. Wait a moment, said Hubbard huskily, starting for the barn. I'll get some rope and help you. The two returned to the Eldridge farm. They found there the dead man's child. She had perched herself on the fallen tree. Damn fool, muttered Hubbard, her mother letting her play around here. A pulley was rigged over the branch, and the rope inserted with the board for a rest. I'll go down, vouchsafed Hubbard. Simpson looked surprised as he assented. It took Hubbard five minutes or so to retrieve the missing skeleton parts. He brought them up, the leg bone and the grinning skull. He was pale when he hauled himself over the edge. I'm a going to fill up that hole myself, he said. All right, retorted Simpson, handling the skull curiously. Go to it. Word traveled of the finding of the ancient skeleton, and the inhabitants began driving thither to see the site. Simpson, a man of some ingenuity, 
had wired the bleached white bones together and suspended them from one of the branches of the fallen tree. The skeleton dangled and swung in the wind. Hubbard, maddened by the delay in publicity, felt himself wearing away. He had become obsessed with conviction that if the hole were filled, his mind would be at rest. The nights of continued sleeplessness were ragging on his nerves, and he was by this time unable to remain in bed. He would throw himself down, fully dressed, waiting until the others were asleep. Then he would steal out. At first he had merely walked the roads, swinging his arms and mumbling, but as the night progressed his stride would quicken, and frequently he would take to running. He would run until his lungs were bursting, and a slaver fed from his mouth. Late travelers began to catch glimpses of the fleeting figure, and the rumor grew that a ghost was haunting the locality of the well, that the skeleton walked. Hubbard grew haggard, but he found himself unable to discontinue his nocturnal prowls, some of which took him miles, but all of which invariably wound up at one place, the well. Here, fagged and exhausted, he would sit until the approach of dawn, staring at the swinging skeleton, mouthing incoherencies, praying, singing hymns beneath his breath, laughing. At the approach of dawn, he would steal home. At last, after interest in the skeleton had subsided and Simpson had consented to its removal, Hubbard loaded his wagon with stones and small boulders and started for the well. That first forenoon, he made three trips, dumping each time a considerable quantity of stones. Next morning, he worked an additional trip. He began to experience surcease, but on the afternoon of the second day, when he made another trip, Simpson came over from his work in an adjoining field. I wanted to see you yesterday, he said, quizzically regarding Hubbard. Mrs. Harper was here. She said her little girl was a-playing around there and dropped a pair of andirons down the well. What of it? Hubbard jerked out. You got to get him out. Why? Because them andirons are relics. But you give me permission to fill the hole. I was kidding you, laughed Simpson. I'm only renting the farm. I ain't got nothing to do with the house and the yard. Without a word, Hubbard turned to his wagon. He got onto the seat and drove off. In an hour, he came back with the same rope that had been used to recover the missing portions of the skeleton. Also, he brought with him a farm laborer who did occasional work for him. Simpson regarded Hubbard amusedly as the latter adjusted once more the pulley, arranged a bucket, and then hitched his team to the end of the rope. Patiently, bucketful by bucketful, the stones were elevated and dumped. Down below in the black interior, Hubbard labored for an hour. At six o'clock he had not found the andirons. Twice he had been compelled to come up for fresh air. His last trip left him so white-faced and weak that he was forced to go home. That night he resorted to sleeping powders but he lay and tossed, wide-eyed, looking through the dark hours. Some time after midnight, he got up. A light was still burning in his wife's room, and tiptoeing down the hall, he paused at her door. In low voices, the mother and daughter were conversing. To his heated imagining, he seemed certain that they were talking of Harper's disappearance. Bumbling to himself, he left the house. He ran down the lane to the highway and along until he came to the Eldridge place. He determined not to stop and succeeded in running by like a frightened animal. His gait accelerated. It was one best described as scurrying as he ran, crouched and low. He thought he saw someone approaching. This turned him. Back he fled with the speed of the wind. Drawn by an irresistible force, he made straight for the Eldridge pathway. He came to the well the entrance which gaped at him. For a moment he stood, with eyes wide open, staring into the black depths. Then, screaming, he plunged in, head first. His cry, long drawn and eerie, hung quavering in the night air. In the Hubbard home, a quarter of a mile away, the mother and daughter heard it. The two listened with palpating hearts. They caught one another's hands. In a hoarse whisper, the mother exclaimed, What's that? 